good morning or uh, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. We'd uh, like to welcome you to the uh, webinar on a discussion of a roadmap for overcoming unbalanced short-termism. Short um, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, sponsors for the uh, webinar today, um, Reinhard Berner Van Duren, which is the uh, law firm where Tiffany Reeves and I are the uh, our shareholders, um, Sussman Godfrey, uh, that's uh, the firm that Ken McNeil is from, and uh, Global Investor Collaboration Services, uh, which is a, um, um, a a consulting firm that assists. Um, institutional investors in um, networking and collaboration, and uh, Preventable Surprises, which is an international think tank focused around um, systemic uh, risk kinds of issues. So um, the uh, attendees will be on mute, and um, we encourage you to send us questions um, through the uh, question box. We uh, hope to get to the Q&A session um, at the end of the webinar. Um, also, uh, for your reference, there are some materials that are attached um, to the um, webinar. So I think you could see that there are three handouts um, that, that includes uh, an article by Leo Strine and um, the World Economic Forum uh, uh, report on um, uh, balancing um, from um, short-termism to long-termism, and a uh, law review article that uh, Ken McNeil and I um, wrote for um, transitioning to from short-termism to long-termism. So um, we're happy to have an expert panel with us today, basically. Uh, the, uh, the next slide shows the uh, the presenters. Um, I'm Keith Johnson. I'm uh, co-chair of Reinhardt Institutional Investor Services and a uh, former general counsel at the uh, State of Wisconsin Investment Board. Um, Leo Strine really needs no introduction. Um, he spent two decades uh, as a uh, judge in Delaware, uh, including a stint as the uh, uh, Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court. He's currently of counsel with uh, Wachtell Lipton. Um, Ken McNeil is a uh, litigator with uh, Sussman Godfrey, and previously he actually uh, was a uh, sociology professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is also my alma mater. Tiffany Reeves is a shareholder um, at Reinhardt in uh, Reinhardt Institutional Investor Services, and um, before joining Reinhardt, she was the uh, general counsel and um, assistant executive director at the uh, Chicago Teachers uh, Public Pension Fund. Allison Taylor is the executive director of ethical systems at the NYU Stern School of Business. She's also an adjunct professor there and um, does a lot of consulting with uh, corporations on culture and behavioral issues and also happens to be a member of uh, one of the World Economic uh, Forum Global Future Councils. So um, with that, let's uh, get right into it. We're planning on focusing on three issues today. And um, the first one is how um, environmental, social, and governance factors and uh, the Caremark case principles uh, fit into uh, business models that might help to stop uh, short-termism. For those of you that don't know, the Caremark case is a Delaware case that uh, established the principle that uh, corporate boards have an obligation to oversee uh, compliance functions. Uh, the second topic that we'll switch to later is how long-term investors can influence uh, corporate decision makers to employ long-term strategic planning and why they would want to do that. And um, finally, we'll talk about how to effectively use advocacy skills in uh, engagements between corporations and um, shareholders. So um, let's uh, kick that off now with uh, moving on to the first topic. And uh, Ken McNeil is going to lead us through a uh, discussion with uh, Chief Justice Leo Strine. Take it away, Ken. Thanks so much, Keith. And I'd like to introduce the audience because that's the key here. 
the audience are, are investors, huge long-term investors, and uh, the corporate boardrooms work for you. And <laughs> the real question today is, what do you want them to do? Um, do you want them to keep up this short-termism, despite the totally changing world we're living in, or, 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 or do you want to move them toward a more of a long-term profitability model that can handle these environmental, social, and other issues that are that are just uh, pressing this world, as as evidence just most recently by this massive COVID problem. We need some guidance, and at a very critical point, this isn't an incremental prop, small problem to deal with for you in telling these corporations what to do. And so what we've done, is we're turning here first today to Justice uh, Leo, former uh, Chief Justice Leo Strine of the Delaware Supreme Court. Uh, there are so many reasons why he has, is the perfect person to give us some real wisdom on the translating a movement toward long-term from kind of aspirational goals to the reality in a boardroom. Uh, there are just so many reasons I can mention. He's, uh, he's been, uh, he's seen on the front line as a judge, these huge fraud problems in corporations. He's, he's uh, written, he's on the faculty of both uh, Harvard and University of Pennsylvania Law School. He's just uh, every man, uh, he's, I mean, for all seasons on this uh, situation, and most particularly, one of his great papers I first got interested in was in 2005, a speech he gave in London on this whole issue long before ESG was strong or some of these other movements are strong, saying we've got to start short-termism, and, and long-term investors have to get involved. Now, he uses two legal principles. Uh, to, for his basis for the chart I'm showing, the first thing he's written a lot on is pressing long-term investors to influence corporate board members to do this long-term risk assessment and decision-making, because as he's defined in Delaware law and the Delaware courts, the corporation's in business for the long-term, not for the short-term, and he's been very critical of that. And on the, in, in terms of the Delaware business judgment rule, which historically have been cynically viewed as a see no evil, hear no evil type of thing. As long as you don't know any about it, you, you're okay on your calls. The Delaware court in Caremark has begun to take a much more proactive role in forcing directors to monitor, monitor what's going on in a corporation's risk-wise and to make ensure compliance when problems are uh, out of hand. If I may just quickly go forward, just a couple more slides and then we'll get into this discussion. Uh, the, uh, under his one hat, He's talked a great deal about the creation and preser preservation of long-term wealth. Okay, and the next slide. And under his judicial hat, as recently as the Bluebell case, he continues to establish that, this, the, that the board has a good faith duty to care, and which is a, and a failure to make that effort constitutes a breach of duty, duty of loyalty. Next slide. Uh, Stride's efforts after these 15 years are really paying off in, a, in wonderful ways in the sense that finally, in 2019, over 200 of CEOs in the Business Roundtable have now committed to what they call long-term building long-term value for companies. And the next slide. So today, we're going to focus particularly on an important paper that you should all read it's uh, it's tied in with your materials on this, uh, that you get with this webinar. Uh, Caremark and ESG are perfect together, and so we're now going to begin that discussion uh, with uh, with Leo. Uh, and you may want to introduce yourself, Leo. You're on the screen as well, I believe. We can go off the PowerPoint. Good to be with you all, and um, and and that's thanks for the flattering introduction, Ken. I I think that Jamie Dimon, who's a we at Delaware love is because they're such a great Delaware employer than they really are. I I, I, give, I, I don't want to take credit for his leadership on the BRT, but I was pleased to see that. And um, and in terms of my goals for the long term, it's pretty obvious that it's um, finally curing. I have, can everybody see, I've got a wristband on this arm too. I have a Fitbit on the other. Can everybody see this clear wristband? See, you can, you look right through it, and it, it signalizes the suffering of those who suffer from male pattern baldness. And I'm hoping that if we focus on the long-term, Ken, there'll be a real cure for this scourge. And um, so, um, you know, I, I just wanted to put that plug in early in the program. Excellent. 
Now, here's where we need to help. We're talking now about how to turn an aspirational goal into real reality in the boardroom. And, but to do that, we first have to analyze how hard that is. So you might give us a, some of your thoughts that come out of this paper on, on what happened. I mean, what, how, how tough is this problem for a corporate director historically focused on short-term profitability to deal with very complex ESG goals? Well, I think this is actually a great question for the kind of audience members we have, because if you think about what we've done to corporate boards over the last, over this century and going back into the 90s, is we've really added checklist item after checklist item. And I want, in one of my earlier papers, I looked at, for example, what were the proposals made, Ken, by institutional investors in the wake of the meltdown leading, you know, from Enron and WorldCom. You might have thought one of the perfectly sensible proposals you can make validly under state law and on the SEC would be to create a risk management committee to address company specific risks in different industries because that was a managing the to the market meltdown there were fraud. But what were the proposals about? Get rid of classified boards, get rid of pills, pay CEOs in stock options. What was also true after Dodd-Frank, the same sort of thing. And so when you look at what's happened to directors, there have been mandates coming out of Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank that have made their jobs more difficult. We've had the audit committee's core financial duties have been made more difficult. We've put things on compensation committees. But at the same time, the impulses they're really getting from the people who vote their shares is towards managing to the market, paying management based on total stock return, um, dealing with uh, ever increasing activist campaigns, uh, withhold campaigns. And so when you're talking about boards trying to situate their focus on compliance or on sustainability, they've got to, they've got to factor it into this very um, uh, input rich environment realizing that legal checklist requirements always come first and the most serious of those tend to be in the financial area and not in other kinds of areas of risk. And so I think one of the real challenges for boards is how do you integrate this stuff efficiently with everything you else have to do? And also, to be honest, how we create a corporate governance environment that's a bit more supportive of patient efforts at capitalism, reduce some of the short-term noise that really is quite distracting for corporate managers and directors. Well, if you were if you were sitting today in front of the uh, CEO of um, a key company in the United States, and, and he's turning to you and asking you the point blank question, how do I start? How do I start thinking about turning my ship around so that I'm not just overloaded with all these uh, compliance issues, and I need to start focusing on these long-term risks, uh, including ESG? Well, and I think. Part of it starts, Ken, with recognizing that they're not really different and to think about it like a business person. For example, think about, you know, what, what you try to teach your children when they drive, right? And for your insurance things, right? You want your children or yourself to be a better than average driver, a safer than average driver. But that's not unrelated to, is it to compliance? Stopping at stop signs? When you can safely stop at the yellow, you don't speed up to 75, you don't speed. You know, the, 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 what I'm saying is, and if, for example, sustainability, there's been a big focus in sustainability, and we'll talk about some of the other factors on environmental compliance. That's great that you're gonna reduce your carbon impact. Can you really be a responsible company in the environmental space by reducing your carbon impact, but somehow violating CERCLA or which is the you know wastewater uh, you know the underground kind of contamination statute or the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act? No, these are integrated things, right? And the metrics that you would use to measure whether you're meeting the legal minimum are valuable in showing that you've gone beyond it and met your societal goals and the things you're portraying to the marketplace. And the other thing about the legal minimums is it makes sure that none of us have blinkers on because all of us have a set of values, and sometimes we might lose sight of things that other people think are important. And the laws that govern companies and govern us as individuals, they have a comprehensive array of things. And the interesting thing, Ken,
when you think about it is where does compliance have bite, right, for a company? It's going to be where you touch up against your stakeholders, right? You're going to have, if you're a pharmaceutical company, there's going to be a lot more salience for you as a, a business around things like the safety of your products. Well, and that's because that's also how you affect society. Well, that's going to be where uh, one of your key compliance areas, but it's also one of your key stakeholder issues if you're actually trying to be a good corporate citizen. So one of the things I think business people have done too little over the years is to think about the board itself as a managerial unit and to allocate responsibilities across the board in an efficient way. And I think they're struggling right now with situating this focus on ESG or what I call EESG because I believe employees deserve their own letter and shouldn't be buried in the S. And some boards, for example, are putting it in a different committee from their compliance. They're not really aligning their sustainability um, goals with their related compliance goals and then making sure that their managerial functions marry up with that and that the reporting relationships to the board marry up with that. And I think one of the key takeaways I would have for everybody is if you do step back and think about this as a business person, and integrate it, you're going to save yourself as managers and you're going to save your board time and you're going to be more effective because you're going to deploy expertise and time on task in a much more business-like fashion. You know, a uh, couple of observations. Once you, me you mentioned the E, the extra E and ESG should be employees. And that's not only for the benefit of the employees, but I, I think one key point you make in your paper is that if you're going to move beyond minimal legal compliance or even below that under this all of this confusion to a really strong compliance to really achieve the goal you need a diverse set of employees you need a diverse set of people so they can bring the input to deal with these broader uh, social goals and not just short-term profits could you comment yeah. a little on that? yeah exactly right and it's not just you know it's not just sort of for you know goo goo stuff like good government hug a tree kind of stuff it's a business function too. I mean, you think about it, Dr. Fauci, now I'll put aside his age because people have said, ah, Strangle, he's too old to serve. Think about someone with Dr. Fauci's talent. There are many companies in the food and pharma industry where he couldn't serve on the key compliance committee, probably. Why? Because it would be the audit committee and you would have to certify that you're a financial expert. But for a pharma company or a food safety company, having someone like Dr. Fauci bring real expertise to bear on a key factor of their production, right? If they don't make their products safe for their customers, then that's gonna cost them revenue. Frankly, we've seen during the pandemic, if you don't have a safe plant for your employees, you risk shutdowns, that's not just, and you risk injuries to them, which could bring claims from them. But even more, if your plant is shut down, right, Ken, you're not producing product and you're going to be hit by both your stockholders and your workers. But when we have these situations where we tended to put everything through audit, you have people with real business relevant expertise who get screened out or, frankly, don't get enough time on task. And relatedly, there are people in the company who do those key functions who don't get time with the board because the audit committee has so much to do and financially that there's this huge line and so one of the things you and i talk about i always say that the first thing a, a director should ask is how does this company make money and i mean that in the most mundane sense which is what are the products we make or the services to live to deliver how what goes into making those products and selling them and how do we make money? Because if you think about that, you're identifying where you're going to have your compliance risk, because that's going to be where regulation rubs up against you, right? If you're a food company or a pharma company, they're going to be consumer safety issues. In the food production thing, there's also going to be a lot of workforce safety issues, often immigration, other things. When you identify those things, they're also going to be the areas in which folks who care about whether you're a good citizen are going to look at you. They're going to be officers in the company, right, Ken, who are responsible for dealing with those functions, 
if you can integrate your approach to sustainability and compliance so that they're doing it and pulling all in one direction and being mindful of the legal minimum and the higher goals you're setting, that's going to be efficient for them. Then if you can marry that up at the board level by saying, you know, frankly, for every company, I'm skeptical. There may be some companies for which audit can be the, you know, the soup to nuts compliance and ESG committee. I'm very skeptical that's true in most industries. I think in general, you'll want to have one other kind of risk management committee that really takes in your specific industry. And if you think about then, you've spread the talent of the board. You're able to use the people like Dr. Fauci or other folks to address those really key business risks. And critically, you're, allow, you're, you're giving the people in the company who deal with those risks a direct reporting, reporting relationship to a board committee, taking pressure off audit, allowing it to do its job more effectively, and just using human talent in a much more rational and effective way. Well, this point about the fact that the audit committee, which is set up to monitor, which is the Caremark approach here, turns out to be a bottleneck is, is a critical theme that needs to be worked through on the, at the board level. But the second point I think you're making is the board itself needs to allocate these responsibilities so they're, they're having different people that can bring different viewpoints on these broader goals other than just um, rubber stamping whatever comes out of the uh, audit. Uh, it, do you have any other thoughts about the kind of boards that we need uh, that will accomplish this? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things is you just got, I mean, and again, I want to, I think in most companies, you're going to find that your audit committee directors are among your really standout people. I think they really tend to put a lot of effort in. I think one time, sometimes they're so good that they put themselves and the company at risk. What I mean by that, Ken, is audit committee people tend, and I think Keith knows this, Alice and Tiffany probably know this, they tend to be the kind of people who like to grab a task, they like to have control of it all. But the problem is there's too much to do. And also the fact that you were a, a Goldman Sachs banker or a CFO of a company or a KPMG account doesn't mean that you know, you know, frankly, Jack from environmental compliance or pharmaceutical compliance or the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or, uh, you know, for example, in the, in, in the cyber place, cyber security issues and customer data issues, which could be ex existentially important. And there's also just so much to do. So I don't want to be critical of them, except to say, we all have to be aware of our limitations. And when there's so much to do in time constraints, then it's natural. And by the way, this is where the legal mandates come in, Ken, because if you look at the legal mandates in the, for, on audit committees, compliance is in there as sort of approving it, right, Ken? But most of it, and Keith, I think, would tell you, most of it's pretty core financial. So the other stuff tends to be subordinated. So really what I'm saying is if you look at a particular business, if it's making ice cream like Marchand, if it's making you know, uh, drug products like a Pfizer, if it's an oil company, which is obviously gonna have an environmental issue, if it's a thing where there's cybersecurity because you're taking in a lot of data, that if you identify what your key business kind of risk area is, create a committee to deal with that, then you can actually comprise a board with more diverse skills. And again, I want to emphasize, these are business relevant skills. Finance is not the, you know, people like Alexander Graham Bell, other folks, you know, their key innovations that drove value weren't necessarily just finance, right? They were other sorts of things, product development, service development. You're able to bring onto the board a, a more diverse group of uh, uh, of talents, and frankly, in terms of diversity, that also may allow you to see black Americans, women directors, because finance is actually one of the areas that remains the most behind in inclusiveness along gender and race lines. And whereas in things like supply chain, logistics, actually, if you look at the military, if you look at some of the regulatory areas, human resources, things that are really relevant to business, you'll find that there's probably more inclusive talent that you can include. So there's a lot of power to this if you think about it. And by the way, that's also why I think the compensation committee ought to be rethought because you have a group of the board that focuses most of their time on an HR issue, but it taps us to just obsess over the C-suite. And by the way, our institutional investor community knows they bear a lot of the responsibility for that. 
if you think about the compensation committee becoming a workforce committee, a la what's going on in the UK, having top to bottom responsibility in that area, one, that's going to help you set executive comp better because if they're actually approving the overall compensation system for the company, they're going to recognize that human talent is a lot more than the C-suite. They also would be the natural committee to focus on important issues like having a harassment-free uh, workforce, right? To make sure, workplace, to make sure that there is no sexual harassment, to make sure that there's pay equity along racial and gender lines, that there's a racially and, and gender inclusive approach to hiring and promotion. If you put that all in the workforce committee, you think about that. You have an audit committee that really is focused very intently on financial risk, which is important. You'd have a company specific sort of risk management committee. Then you'd have a committee that really would deal with your HR issues. You could then have cross fertilization, Ken, and it doesn't mean audit wouldn't approve the overall approach, but you could really use the human talent of the board and management, I think, in a more effective way to become, you know, to have a company that really addresses its long term risks and focuses on sustainable value and walks the talk in terms of living up to its stated principles about treating stakeholders well. Let me say this. I mean, uh, this this guidance is so important for this audience because uh, you have the power to make these boards change. And what you're being given is a vision or a model from uh, Justice Strine on how to do this. This is complex organizational behavior. The topic, by the way, special thing I taught at the university. But it is a very important to shift now to a much more complex model of how corporations work and not simplistic legal uh, regulations that uh, just assume uh, very simple solutions by just passing more regulations. So I might be a good time, maybe uh, Keith, to transfer to the next topic. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Leo. And I, I want to just ask Leo a question before uh, we, we transition over to you, Ken. Um, since the uh, federal level of government has basically been responsible for laying on all of the uh, um, sort of compliance and checklist types of items uh, on top of each other, um, Leo, I'm wondering if, if you think that uh, Delaware might offer investors and companies the ability to uh, sort of get away from the checklist kinds of issues and focus on long-term purpose of the uh, corporation and how to actually get there as opposed to just doing checklists? I think Delaware can be part of the solution, Keith, um, but I think it really requires the investor community um, stepping up. I think one of the real challenges for the institutional investor community in terms of the good statements that have come out of some of the mainstream investment funds like Vanguard and State Street and the BRT is whether they will support the move to the public benefit corporation model of governance. It is a stockholder driven model where you have all the core protections against self-dealing and, and breaches of fiduciary duty. It does temper Revlon, so in a Revlon, in a sale of the company, you still have to be good to the stakeholders. And But it really focuses the board, as you know, Keith, on long-term sustainable growth, tempers a little bit of managing to the market, and it gives accountability because it requires, it's really ahead of the curve. They require, you know, we talk about purpose now, but the statutes from the beginning is required a statement of purpose and reporting on how you're being true to your goals. And so, and Delaware has just made it easier. A public company can now convert with the majority vote, which makes sense. You used to be able to invert to a tax haven in the Caymans, and it was a majority vote. You could go to a, a, a Pennsylvania, which had draconian anti-takeover statutes, majority vote, but to come a, a public benefit corporation was a super majority. Now you can really do that. There've been a couple, as your investors on the phone know, there've been a couple, really three, uh, public benefit corporation conversions. One was not in the U.S. Danone, essentially, Keith, became a French uh, equivalent, and they have ADRs on the U.S., which your your good investor friends on the call um, have owned stock in for years. They own stock in great German and Scandinavian companies that are on, and Dutch companies that are under this, and we've had Lemonade 
and and we have a, a, there's an organic farms going public this week. And so I think moving towards this model plus some federal reform, I don't think we can do it alone, Keith. And I think, for example, I would commend to your folks on the phone going to every three or four years say on pay on the condition that the company doesn't change the pay plan during that period and letting you focus every year on a quarter of the company's and their pay plan and have a really long-term approach to incentivizing management and having the SEC be giving authority to have sustainability standards. If you put that together with a public benefit company approach becoming the market standard, I think for long-term investors, you'd really have a more sensible governance arrangement that really aligns the interest of long-term investors, the people who represent them, and American workers. Thanks, Leo. Um, very, very helpful comments from you. Really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Um, Ken, why don't you take us into uh, topic two and uh, tell us about uh, both how long-term investors can influence corporate decision makers and um, why investors should care about um, long-term strategic planning. Well, uh, let's go to the first slide um, uh, after this one, if we could. Uh, and before I get into this, let me just say this. We're, uh, Keith and I have been working in this area of um, how legal regulation, and particularly Delaware law, could help change the rules of the game. Uh, we have an old model built into our tort system called deterrence. And the way you do it is if a company does something wrong, you go sue them and get some money. It, it, candidly, in the 21st world of corporations, it's, it's probably a waning model in terms of its real impact, as we've seen in some of the fraud cases. But because the time the damage has been done, which is, can be global in some instances, uh, all you're gonna do in most of these class actions is collect a nickel on the dollar, as all the studies show. Uh, the damage has been done. How do we get up front and have set the rules of the game so this doesn't happen? And that's what uh, Leo Strine is trying to suggest. It's a complex organizational issue, but how do we put leverage? First thing I want to say is that the big thesis here that I would like to propose is that you have to change corporate accounting systems and monitoring systems, but to think long term. And if you don't do that, you make a mistake. In the classic example, auto industry, right after World War I, uh, with, with uh, Alfred Sloan's great uh, guidance, actually created all major short-term financial control systems that dominate the U.S. business system today. It was to make sure they didn't spend too much on inventory short term and, and bankrupt the company, which almost happened after World War One during a period, by the way, of a flu, okay, a swine flu, uh, of the, of the Spanish flu. Uh, shortly after that, the auto industry was greatly successful until the 70s, but it, they failed to look at any long-term accounting, and the, and the uh, Japanese came in and in, in just a couple of years took about 20% of their market share away. Four General Motors gradually quit and caught on, changed their accounting systems to measure long-term customer satisfaction. It's a totally different world today. Changing accounting systems really is critical because otherwise there's a blind eye in their thinking. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, unfortunately, and this is data coming from McKinsey and others here recently, we're now learning that most of the S&P 1500 corporations don't even have long-term strategic plans. 85% of them have a planning horizon less than five years. It's hard for some academics to believe that, but, but those of us who have been in the real world of corporations representing them or being on the other side know that, that a lot of stuff is short-term. There's no measurement of long-term capital efficiencies, and yet most of these companies are basing their value today on the stock market based on earnings going out 15 and 20 years. So we need to get the accounting systems caught up with the with the, the goals that these the, that we're having to face in this uh, increasingly complicated world next next slide uh, we know for example from recent studies that companies that do have long-term planning that smaller percents that do are actually uh, contributing and one study showed up to 80 percent more profit over the uh, 10 years from I think it's 203 to 213 than, than, uh, than the uh, short-term focus companies. Another study shows that we would have created an additional 5 million jobs and added a trillion dollars uh, if, if, uh, if, if these, the, the same 
long-term companies, uh, the, the, if we generate the same profits as the long-term focused companies. Next. So the nuts and bolts question is how to change these short-term assistance. One of the things that we've been hearing from uh, uh, Leo Strine is how you're gonna have to change the board in order to start that process going. Uh, next slide. Uh, and in addition to that, I think we can be, we're helped in changing the rules of the game because Caremark, and our paper will go into this in more detail as well as Leo's, is that Caremark has been gradually moving over the past 20 or 30 years, uh, often in response to the latest short-term fraud crisis like Enron or Worldcom or others, to gradually moving from just hitting a director for failure to heed strong red flags to failure to institute legal compliance to situations where they're consciously regarding known risk to a failure to make a good faith effort in the duty of care. That we, the suggestion here is there may be some room to, to go against companies that are not doing this right now as a way of continuing to make visible and enforce proactively the pressure on these companies to, uh, to think long term, uh, not just checklist, which often ends up short term. Next. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the, the, our, our position in the paper is that uh, this whole issue of, of, of long-term uh, failure to do long-term strategic planning and risk assessment is truly the elephant in the room that we have to address today. And the next slide, Brian, is that we lay out some of this in this uh, article that is attached, I think, to your materials here uh, that and that suggests that Caremark's focus on the duty to monitor and comply is totally consistent with, a, with an economic or business-oriented focus on changing the accounting systems, so they're measuring long-term risk, long-term benefits. Now, a lot of people say the future is uncertain, why plan long-term? That's exactly when you plan long-term. You plan best case, worst case, middle case scenarios, and that makes you think, the corporation, think about all the things that could happen and that's when you generally come up with the best plan going forward. Next slide. Uh, we, we, Keith and I compare it to using a three mile radar on a super tanker that can't turn around within 20 miles. Um, I once had a part on the plenty of side in the Exxon Valdez case, so I can tell you that's a real problem. Okay, next. Uh, we only have to look at some recent headlines to understand what we're learning from corporate short-termism, uh, the, the, the opioid problem, uh, the, the plane problem, uh, Facebook problems, we can go on and on. If we had the kinds of, of, of developments that, that Leo has described and the pressure by institutional investors to get this fixed up front proactively rather than just suing them in a class action at the end of the game, this would be a, a huge improvement in, in a legal strategy that's, that's appropriate for the 21st century. Next. There are a lot of different things that investors and uh, long-term investors can do here. Uh, and you need to understand some, almost a menu. Uh, we now have the business roundtable commitment, but no one or very few of you institutional funds have gone in and sent letters saying, okay, we want you to, institute immediately processes and show us what you're going to do to implement that resolution. Shareholder resolutions, all, and then it moves more and more toward the kinds of things that are appropriate in the Caremark situation, asking for books and records, asking if indeed, and asking companies to disclose whether or not they're doing long-term planning. You know, it's interesting how many trillions of dollars those uh, institutions of which are represented on this, on this, on this webinar today as an audience how many trillions of dollars are out there, and yet you're investing in a lot of companies like in a black box. You don't know whether the 15% doing the long-term planning or the 85% that aren't. You, there, there's some disclosure requirements you could begin to press forward uh, both informally and uh, legally as we outlined in the paper. So there, if we'll go to the next slide um, quickly. Uh, it's more than just a spectrum, it's, it's, it's a menu. And, uh, and we need to be thinking very carefully about walking into a boardroom with a carrot and a stick, with the ideas that Leo Strine has, 
and, and trying to implement those, which are, you can do in a very sophisticated manner, but also a stick that's sophisticated as well. And that is not just a, a, we're going to file a lawsuit with a class action firm. That 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 that's a thing of the past. Uh, I think in terms of it, all it does is just clean up the pieces and candidly give an insurance policy uh, to to the folks for the damage already done by settling it at a nickel on the dollar. Let's go to the next slide. I believe that uh, may be it for this section, Chief. You may have some questions, but that's pretty much. Uh, the big point. The big point is now that, it, it, and, and one other point, it's the perfect time for you as investors in this audience to start pressing corporate thinking toward the long term. Right now, you got you got what it takes. You got the money, and the they're going the corporation's going to be desperately begging for that money in the coming months and years. COVID is under upending all many traditional business models, and it's easier at that point to go into a board and tell them we want you to do long-term thinking. We as investor are gonna be investing long-term, show us your plan. And third, to the extent it's helpful using Caremark as legal leverage to change the rules of the game in the boardroom away from short-termism. Ken, thanks. Um, I do wanna ask you one question. I, I've heard um, a number of institutional investors, shareholders, express concern about shifting to more of a focus on long-term strategic planning out of fear that that is going to dilute the focus on um, providing shareholder returns as the, uh, as the main focus of the company. And also uh, concerns about uh, taking into consideration employees and other constituencies like Leo is uh, is suggesting is is that something that uh, you think investors should be concerned about? All I would do is point them back to that visual metaphor of the three mile radar on a super tanker. You know, you can't continue to make profits long term uh, with a short term focus. Uh, a friend of mine, who's a former academic dean, University of Chicago Business School, says that from a market efficiency point of view, short termism is inefficient. It is the long term. It's precisely the legal principle that Leo Strine has emphasized in some of his opinions that a corporation is here for the long term and, 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 and pension funds, institute long term investors, they're here for 60, 70 years. Uh, that the model has to be that, uh, the long term. It doesn't mean that all decisions have to be long term. It just means that when you're looking one way or the other, you're looking at both at the same time. It's going to help you make your short term decisions better. And it's going to make your long-term investments better by, by having it. If you don't have any system at monitoring and a sophisticated one, like, like Leo Strine has emphasized today, it's just going to all fall out into checklists or waste baskets or, or endless bureaucratic paperwork. Okay, thanks. Well, let's, um, let's move on to Allison, and uh, we'll put Allison's slides up. Um, Ken has talked about the uh, elephant in the room being uh, short-term thinking, and uh, Allison is going to have another elephant for us, and uh, I think that it might help investors be more effective in their engagements with companies. Go ahead, Allison. Allison, oh, are you on mute? I should not be. Can you hear me now? You're fine, yep. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, as Keith mentioned in the introduction, um, I've been working on questions of organizational behavior and culture, and particularly as this relates to ESG and responsible business for some time. And we're in a very interesting situation where both the investor and corporate community at this point do seem to clearly understand the business case for long-term thinking. Investors also understand that ESG performance correlates with strong corporate performance. Um, company leaders very often know very clearly that long-term thinking is key to their success and the pandemic and issues like climate change are proving this more and more. Plus there is a huge research base but we still seem to be having an issue moving from A to B. So investors say that corporate leaders won't listen and corporate leaders say that investors just want short-term metrics. So we're a little bit stuck. 
and we need to consider how to move on um, from this situation of gridlock. I would more broadly say I think the responsible business movement has in many respects been doing the same thing over and over again for a very long time and expecting a different result. So I think I would say that there is a lot of very, very useful um, conceptual um, information in the behavioral science and organizational and so social psychology fields that could help break this gridlock. So I'm going to start off by, by returning to our elephants. This is a, a morning with a lot of elephants. And so the first thing we can think about is individual cognition and human behavior and how humans really make decisions. And we tend to, as a community, to um, very much focus on rational and business case arguments for ESG and long-term thinking. And this will only get us so far because the human brain is in fact divided into a more intuitive um, part of the brain and then a more rational decision-making part of the brain. Many of you may be familiar with Daniel Kahneman um, who has this concept of system one and system two thinking. The concept here of the rider and the elephant is, is basically identical. I think it's just a nice metaphor. So um, our brain has a, a conscious, rational thinking part, slow, effortful, analytical, clarity is key, makes decisions based on self-awareness and control. But we also have another part of our brain that is emotional, experiencing, it's fast, automatic, intuitive, stories are really key, it lacks self-control. This is where our biases come from and our biases are of course very useful adaptive ways that we can make very, very uh, quick decisions. But the reality of the human brain is that the elephant is far, far more powerful than the rider. And we are very um, prone to, sell, to justifying and making rational arguments for whatever the elephant wants to do. And we've observed this, I think, um, in our current context of political polarization, that is very, very difficult to use facts to change hearts and minds. So what does all this mean? It means that if you want to drive change in a, in a social system of any kind, including our modern day corporations, you need to think at three levels. You certainly need to direct the rider. You certainly need to provide that rational evidence, give clear direction, reduce mental paralysis. I'm certainly not saying that making those rational arguments is irrelevant but you also need to understand how human beings think and understand and leverage intuition and bias for positive change. And then beyond that, beyond the question of individual cognition, we also need to consider the social and organizational context. And you've heard a lot about that already this morning with both Leo and Ken suggesting very concrete ways that we can change the environment in which boards sit, we can change the overall corporate governance um, environment to make long-term thinking and make traction for ESG as simple as possible. So in addition to questions of individual cognition, we need to understand that social reality is a social construct. The situation is more powerful than we realize. And we need to think about group dynamics and how human beings behave in groups if we're going to really understand how investors can influence corporations for positive change. Because what we're really talking about is a group that is external to the corporation trying to have leverage over the corporation. So this is a question of, of group dynamics and intergroup relations. So let's get more specific about cognitive biases and organizational psychology and how this might play out. There are a lot of cognitive biases listed on this slide. I will just mention a few of them and their direct consequences. A first very obvious one is we're very influenced by who gives us the message and not just what the message is. So one very obvious implication here would be if we are speaking to boards that are, are populated by former CFOs and CEOs, it is a good idea to have someone of that stature and background making this, this argument for long-term thinking and ESG investment 
maybe not um, you know, a 20 something investor analyst. Incentives are also um, another very big issue here. Our responses to incentives are shaped by very predictable shortcuts and losses lose loom much larger than gains and any changes to incentives any changes to organizational structure are coded by our brains as a loss so there's a lot of loss aversion and risk aversion if what we're trying to do is get corporations to change how they incentivize thinking and behavior and we really need to account for that in what we're asking them to do Another few points on this slide, the norms and defaults in which we operate are extremely important. The famous ASH experiment shows that if you are alone in a group, um, you are very, very likely to um, correspond to the, the majority opinion in that group, even if you are quite clear in your mind that it is wrong. So if there is just one board member pushing for ESG and more long-term thinking, that board member is quite likely to fail unless there is at least one other person to back them up, even if the entire board knows that that one board member is, is right. We also need to think about things like ego. We, we act in ways that make us feel better about ourselves and we, we are very inclined to justify our own behavior. So persuading uh, boards and senior leadership teams to act will involve um, suggesting things that will make that board feel better about themselves and, and, and show a sense of inspiration. And then we seek to be consistent with our public promises. So this is a very strong argument for a reporting agenda and encouraging companies to set long-term goals and then stick with those goals. I'm gonna spend the rest of the presentation talking about what some of this behavioral research says very specifically about how investors can influence boards and there is quite a lot of research on this. So the key drivers of investor influence over companies are, are power very directly, ownership levels, potential to use shareholder rights, ability to divest, also legitimacy back to that question of the messenger, a strong business case, very deep knowledge of the company. Corporations very often complain that investors making cases for certain types of action don't seem realistic and don't know enough about the business. So you need credibility, you need to leverage reputation and you need considerable interpersonal skills. Then a sense of urgency will help drive change. There's a lot of evidence that companies are more likely to change if there are major ESG risks or negative events. So using those events as leverage and then, and then getting embedded to drive more long-term thinking can be very useful. Of course, reputational threats, activism, media coverage, and that kind of thing. There are a lot of um, success factors for engagement um, approaches. So if you're going to in, get engaged in, in direct dialogue, very different success factors from if you're going to get involved in a divestment campaign. And there's a lot of evidence that I can share with anyone interested um, on the line about the key success factors of these, these different kinds of investor approaches. But I'll move on in the interest of time. So one question is how can investors increase impact through their choice of messenger and then how they frame their message? Collaboration between investors works. Coordinated engagements with a lead investor and supporting investors are more likely to succeed. They indicate shifting norms and they indicate changes in the environment. It also helps a great deal if the lead investor is domestically and culturally aligned with the corporation they're speaking to. Again, that, that priming and affect and, and making sure that you're using interpersonal skills to communicate with the company. Seniority and experience matter a lot in terms of who the messenger is. I've mentioned this already. There's also a very important point that if you're pushing as a long-term investor for long-term thinking in the company, you need to look at your own incentives. This point has been made that many pension funds today have moved to more short-term incentives for their staff. So there's a, there's a disconnect there in terms of credibility. And then obviously including key decision makers in the dialogue if possible, not just investor relations. So long-term strategic foresight will provide a business and moral imperative. So very important to clarify the message around a simple issue like that, rather than pushing for particular performance on short-term ESG metrics uh, driven by different bodies. 
There's also evidence that using the E and the S is a good way to drive the G. The E and the S are more emotive, they're more reputationally driven a lot of the time. And, and there is evidence that successful engagements on E and S tend to drive governance over the long term. So that might be a leverage point that you can use to try to uh, get traction for some of the messages that, that Leo's explained already. Long-term incentives, very, very important. We don't get anywhere there without that because of the loss of version. And then aligning with these wider efforts to shift norms and getting investor traction behind that, really, really important. But repetition is, is very important as well. Active ownership can reduce internal managerial myopia, but it's not going to be a one and done exercise. You need really need to work to shift internal norms. So before the dialogue, establishing the facts, deepening knowledge, clarifying objectives, a single focus on the long term business case will be much more successful than driving issue specific action, prioritizing a small number of key messages and selecting the messengers and then presenting clear actions, collaborating, offering solutions, framing your requests as drivers of strategic foresight and considering cultural and geographic influences in your conversation. All of that will help. Thanks so much. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. It's obvious that we could um, spend a couple of webinars just on the uh, behavioral and emotional aspects of improving um, investor communication with uh, with boards. Um, what I'd like to do now is switch back to the other slides and um, Tiffany is going to just run us pretty quickly through a, a couple of tools uh, for starting dialogues and uh, um, how they might be used. Great. Thank you, Keith. Um, so I, I want to just go back to uh, the spectrum that Ken had noted um, on his slide about this. There's really a spectrum of choices um, uh, when it comes to engaging with corporations uh, to encourage long-term strategic planning. And so Ken mentioned, you know, anything from writing investor letters all the way to um, litigation options. Um, so th this first um, slide here is an example of a uh, draft long-term strategic planning uh, resolution, which is, would be one of the tools that an investor um, could use to engage with a corporation. And um, I would note that this resolution um, invites transparency regarding the strategic planning process and then also the oversight process, which is entirely consistent with, uh, with prior um, guidance from the SEC um, in its uh, no action letter uh, regarding Motorola. And uh, so this, this is an example of a resolution or tool that shareholders could use in engaging with, uh, with, with corporations. The se second example um, is, uh, which is the next slide, is um, a draft corporate long-term bylaw. And this particular bylaw highlights um, that the objective of the board is to build sustainable long-term shareholder value and that this requires the board to be responsible for oversight over the strategic planning um, in the long term, but also over risk management processes. And I think the interesting thing about this proposed bylaw is that it requires the board to ensure that employees, customers, suppliers, communities, um, uh, uh, the board considers all these issues, and, and in addition to ESG, uh, when it's develop, developing and implementing its long-term strategic planning process, um, governance, and then also reporting practices. So, so it's important for kind of the, the totality of issues that can put, uh, potentially impact uh, a corporation be considered. Um, one of the reasons why um, or why I wanted to bring my perspective this morning is because Keith and I. I represent public pension funds. And it's important to understand that public pension funds take a long-term perspective, um, uh, in addition to a short-term perspective, because they're looking at the, their fiduciary duties that run to their beneficiaries. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's important that those fiduciaries are considering the long-term, engaging with companies about the long-term, um, because that's a, a part of their core fiduciary duties. And I think, uh, you know, uh, Ken mentioned this as well earlier, that that uh, that this this perspective, this long-term perspective, 
ties plainly to fiduciary duties of public pension fund um, investors. Thank you, Tiffany. Mm -hmm. um, we have run out of time, but I would like to, and there actually are no questions in the queue, so everybody's done a good job of, um, you know, covering your points uh, without leaving any questions. But I would like to, uh, as we wrap up pretty quickly, just give everybody a chance to uh, highlight one takeaway from what we've been talking about today that you think would be most helpful um, for investors. And uh, maybe, Leo, we could start off with you, then go to Ken, Allison, and then Tiffany. Yeah, I would just say to our institutional investors that if, for your own purposes, and for purposes of supporting companies and doing it right, if you really do recognize the relationship between, you know, complying with your legal obligations to society and your stakeholders and the idea of being going further and achieving a higher standard and support them in thinking about structures that integrate them and do it effectively, I think you're going to be pleased because you have companies that are more attentive to the long-term risk that you care about and are using the time of their managers of their boards more effectively. And so if you can think about what you can do as institutions to support that sort of thinking, I think that would be a very constructive thing to do. Yeah. Well, I think the bottom line here is that we're in a new world. Uh, the whole ways of thinking don't work, to quote Albert Einstein, don't get out of uh, problems you got into with the same thinking that got you into them or something to that effect. I think we have the new world. We have to have new models and we have to have new understandings of both how law works and how corporations work. And I don't think you have any choice to start that process. It's really in that very promising era. We finally found a crisis opportunity moment to, um, to move forward in these pension funds uh, and institutional investors, I think, need to start pressing the corporation right in that process. Allison. Um, I would say that what you engage on and the rational arguments that you make as investors are not sufficient. You need to think about how you engage and to get concepts from organizational psychology and human behavior to think about how we're really going to get from A to B. We all understand what we need to do. We are less sure about how to do it. And there is information out there that can help us. Okay. And I would just say that for institutional investors, the, the duty of loyalty and the duty of impartiality require public pension fund, in particular fiduciaries, to look at the long term as well as the short term and the duty of prudence is going to require them to, after taking in all that data information, to take some action. You can't just stick your head in the sand. And so um, public pension fund fiduciaries need to think about ways that they can um, be proactive uh, in engagement and, and kind of uh, reframe shareholder engagement uh, as opposed to just sitting on the sidelines and waiting for somebody else to do it. Good advice. Thank you very much um, to uh, both the presenters and to uh, the folks who attended today. I will be uh, sending out a link to the recording and uh, the materials again, and uh, we hope to have another webinar at some point uh, with uh, some follow-up to this one. So feel free to respond to my email with any suggestions that you might have for what you'd like to have covered. So. Um, with that, I think we'll sign off and uh, everyone uh, stay safe and uh, we'll see you next time.